Сегодня в Кремле Андрей Андреевич Громыко вручил высшие награды Родине группе Герой. Еще одна нота столкнула. Города, где я бывал, по которым тосковал, не знакомы от всех. Иногда их родные города, как Москва, как Париж. А если нет If there is one thing I have learned about the post-apocalypse subgenre, it is that you can trust that Eastern Europeans know their stuff, and there is not a more avid fan base out there. The Stalker video game series is loosely based off the real-life Chernobyl disaster as well as the 1971 novel Roadside Picnic and the 1979 film aptly named Stalker. These games still are updated with new mods and the sheer number of mods from Eastern Europe eclipses whatever we'll see in the West. The Metro series, created by Dmitry Globowski, is both a well-respected international book series as well as a video game series based on the life below the surface after the apocalypse in Moscow. Finally, with regards to the Fallout franchise, there continues to be new fan-made expansions such as Fallout Nevada or the development of Fallout Sonora. Needless to say, and there are dozens of other examples you could mention from various media, if the world comes to nuclear annihilation, there is one half of the world better prepared to deal with the reality of the situation. Now generalizations are not facts, nor are they meant to act as evidence. It would be more correct to state they are trends viewed from an outsider's perspective, sometimes more rooted in truth than mere coincidence. Off the top of my head, I can think of various Eastern European authors with no relation to this genre such as Anton Chekhov, Sergei Dovlatov, or Andrei Subkowski. The sheer prevalence of these mods and fan-made works might be also rationalized by the scarcity and the cost of new games. So, as a result, these players have greater attachment to their games than Western audiences. However, given the vast number of post-apocalypse mods since the 1990s, especially for staples like Fallout, there is perhaps greater cultural significance to this genre because of the after-effects of Chernobyl and the collapse of the USSR. Similar to the weird obsession Western audiences have to zombie media and the emphasis on consuming them like mindless hordes, Oh, look! A late Memorial Day sale on cheaply produced consumer goods to fuel my capitalistic desires. What was I talking about again? Adam. Oh, right. Adam RPG. Pseudo-philosophical discussions of art aside, Adam RPG is more than a mere homage to the Fallout games it clearly took inspiration from. The game itself is as much a satirical celebration of the post-apocalypse fandom as a loosely inspired parallel to the real anguish during the Cold War. Does this statement mean Adam RPG is political? No. Unless having fun and cracking jokes about past events are damnable offenses, comrade. There are political overtones such as hyperbolic statements of communism like in Fallout, but there are no overt messages. The game, as much as the message itself, is a wasteland of our past with no clear meaning but a heap of broken images where the sun beats. What you can be certain of is that you'll always come away with a smile if you can see past the game at its worst, to relish another moment when it outshines its inspirations. If you have any background knowledge of classic RPGs, then the video's opening, as well as the usage of reverse psychology, should immediately inform you that Adam RPG is a spiritual successor to the classic Fallout titles. The real question to ask is, which Fallout or Wasteland game, if any, does Adam best imitate, and what sets this game from its predecessors or its current competition? From the special or classic character sheets and the Wasteland 2 UI aesthetic, the differences should be immediately apparent that Adam did not simply rehash these older games without learning from some of their mistakes. Like Fallout 1 and 2, Adam is a single party member with suggestions for teammates, CRPG with all the problems inherited from before. As someone who didn't like playing the original Fallouts for this one reason, my two problems with this system remain the same. You don't have total control during combat, which adds too much luck to my liking, 
and the lack of cover mechanics makes the strategy feel more like exploiting the AI sightlines. This first limitation has been somewhat addressed with the quality of life update, providing you various commands during combat to corral your teammates from getting killed. However, the gameplay is nowhere near as streamlined as Wasteland 2, which, as a result, discourages players from making non-optimal characters and enjoying their character flaws as a group. As a result, if you didn't like how Fallout 1 and 2 played, then I don't see how Adam will change your mind as the game also ramps up the combat difficulty. In the game's defense, however, Adam does address stat-related problems from Fallout. Now I won't go into all the major changes as I will save that information for the complimentary video on my guide. There are two major changes that I will mention because it would be ignorant to suggest Adam copied and pasted the same mechanics. For starters, weapons have higher skill requirements as well as an attribute requirement, which prevents players creating one character who can use just about anything. In the old fallouts, you could dump 6 points into strength and use almost any weapon until you receive power armor, which gave you another 3 strength points. These skills are also more evenly distributed between five categories of weapons, three of which are firearm related skills. Secondly, every attribute point has value rather than every even value, which is another exploit only diehard Fallout fans would know, and attributes extend to level 11. For example, every point into Dexterity, the atom equivalent of agility in Fallout, gives you one point to your natural armor, or dodge rating whereas every two points gave you an additional action point. If all that information sounds too complex, or if you have never played a traditional Fallout game, then all you need to understand is that you have to be smarter about how you create your character in Atom. Now these deviations have all been about gameplay alterations, but what truly sets Atom apart from any Fallout or Wasteland title is its tone. Fallout 1 was largely serious with only an occasional self-aware wink. Fallout 2 was littered with references and a more lax narrative. And Wasteland 2 also had many references or fourth wall breaking moments that took the player out of the world. The tone of Adam, however, is in a league of its own as it strikes a balance between philosophical satire, sometimes alluding to Fallout or Stalker lore like the tale of the Mojave Courier, and magical realism that sometimes accepts its own insanity. As an example, one of the first characters you meet in the tutorial town, Atranoi, is a man wearing a tinfoil hat who claims you are the spawn of some demon, so you exercise the bourgeois demons out of him and send him into a nearby pig. You might look at this bizarre Baldur's Gate and Animal Farms reference as distracting, but the game takes an agnostic view of the result, leaving you to wonder if the man was really crazy or if you are losing your sanity. Kind of like a game of Russian roulette, you are never quite sure. Jesus fucking Christ! That gun was loaded? Okay, no more meta jokes in this review. As I was illustrating, most side quests and NPCs strike this balance between realism and satire while never going too far to take you out of the immersion. Tim Kaine, lead designer of the original Fallout titles, once had a rule. If the player didn't get the joke or the cultural reference, he or she shouldn't even know the cultural reference is being made. Adam mostly lives up to that rule, although the constant comrade remarks and the fact that everyone speaks so boisterously does juxtapose with the apocalypse in the background, which may be the joke itself or my American cynicism wondering why the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Russians, and the Litvinians are always so upbeat. There are also plenty of in-jokes only Eastern European audiences would get, but there were a few faces and names I could identify. This game also avoids feeling too dated in its humor, since the game takes place in an alternate future of 2005, which doesn't separate it too far from the late 1980s atmosphere it wants to evoke. Another aspect that helps cement its absurdist realism is that the main quest and most of the hubs are all about exploring the wastelands and solving the day-to-day -day dilemmas for profit, information, or happenstance, and you often have five to six means to resolve those situations. These quests, even the mainline quests, are entirely non-linear, which does make your wandering feel more unpredictable as you can stumble across unique random encounters or new side quests as incentives to keep exploring. Even when you have beaten the game, many NPC personalities will change if you play as the opposite sex, and if you play as a female character with the sex appeal trait, you are pretty much on easy mode, and it's this level of richness to the world that makes it all the more enticing to unravel. Combined with this down-to-earth quest design, 
There are no exotic weapons like energy guns, nor many sci-fi elements like power armor, which really bummed me out because the game hints that these things could exist. I mean, just look at how beautiful is this Soviet power armor model. That side alone would make the enemy turn red out of envy. There are several Steam forum posts that suggest that these features could be added in future updates as Atom Team has provided several free additions since its full release. And these more exotic elements wouldn't stand out if they maintain that level of authenticity with the rest of the game. Regardless, the more I describe Adam's world, the more I feel like I am taking away from letting you experience its wonders for yourself. And I haven't even begun to mention a quarter of the most bizarre moments you will find. Although, and I say this statement not because I'm offended, some of the writing may turn some people away from how brazen it can be. And I wouldn't suggest this game for most minors, hence why this video has an age restriction. From the Jewish bookseller who first says, Oy vey, to the side quest where a male prostitute named Mr. Nasty asks you to make a porno with a bunch of mutants, Adam doesn't hold anything back when it wants to be curt. In case you're wondering about the side quest, Mr. Nasty believes the more degenerate a society becomes, the greater its technological advancement. Some dialogue choices honestly made me laugh from how mean-spirited your responses can be, and I wouldn't want the game any other way. Just know what you're getting into before you jump right in and complain about the writing, which is almost all text-based with very few voiceovers. Speaking of which, the writing itself, while it may show some translation flaws the further you play, can have moments where the more serious exchanges can be as evocative as the best lore of New Vegas. Somehow, and I cannot tell you in any great detail why, this surrealist post-apocalypse manages to come together in a way that, as Todd Howard would yeah, say, it, it just works. In short, if Fallout 4 made you crave for punishment because the developers went too soft on the player's actions, then Adam RPG will flog you, verbally and mechanically, when you make a mistake and you will find yourself enjoying it. Most of this review has managed to avoid spoilers outside of one or two side quests, but this section will mainly discuss elements that cannot be discussed without spoiling some aspects of the gameplay and the story. You can skip this section if you desire, but you may want to stick around for the first timestamp as that information will talk about things before the ending whereas the second timestamp will send you to the next section. Although there isn't much to say about the gameplay other than it is in the vein of classic Fallout titles, Explaining why Adam is more difficult than its predecessors would help newcomers. While the old fallouts let you explore the game non-linearly, and there are plenty of people who can go from the start to the final area, the game was designed with a linear progression. If you have ever looked up a walkthrough, you can identify the core progression of weapons and gear from the intended path. Adam doesn't really have this kind of system, although you can obtain certain weapons as quest rewards. Most weapons, gear, and other forms of loot are completely randomized to suit its nonlinear structure. This aspect wouldn't normally be a problem if handled correctly, but this randomized pool of loot is based on your character level, not the game's progression, which can create unintended difficulty spikes. Admittedly, this problem only reared its ugly head at the very last area where the enemies dealt too much damage for my character to handle, even when doped up on painkillers and battle stimulants. If you play the game without the child prodigy or gifted trait, then I don't think you will reach the point where the game demands you to grind away to reach the end game threshold of level 15. In addition to this core progression chain, there is a heavier emphasis in Adam to use aim shots rather than standard shots. Fallout always had these options, but outside of aiming at the head or the eyes for critical hits, or aiming at the arms and the legs to cripple an enemy, or just shooting someone in the groin for flavor text, you never had to use them. If you want to avoid taking too much damage in Atom, however, you will want to prioritize aim shots for most encounters, and sometimes shooting at the gaps in the enemy's armor deals more damage than if you have a good shot at their head. Armor penetration ammo can mitigate some of these problems, but if you could see the armor ratings for your aim shots then I think more people would use them liberally as intended. This gameplay decision also encourages players having at least 8-10 to 10 action points just like the old fallouts so you can make multiple attacks per turn as most weapons use anywhere from 3 to 6 points. By no means is this a deal breaker, but it is a subtle change that will catch most people off guard. 
Finally, there is the problem of recruiting characters and their starting levels. There is Fidel who starts around level 6, Hexogen who starts around level 10, Alexander, who I never recruited as I did not prioritize the player's home base, and not Dogmeat at level 5. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name. Most of these companions will either be at your level or beyond your own when you encounter them, but not Dogmeat is an exception. You find the dog while wandering the waste with a certain survival skill level, and no matter what point of the game you find him, he will always be at level 5. This can create more problems because finding dog armor is almost impossible, but he does have a unique ability tree where you can buff his resistances to damage as well as an incredibly high dodge rating. My recommendation for getting party members, if you plan on taking them, is to get them ASAP so you can keep them close to your own level. Speaking of companions, and this is the part of the section where we enter spoiler territory, most of them feel pointless to the overall narrative. There aren't any side quests associated to them other than moments where you learn a little more about each character from interacting with other NPCs. Their banter, however, is incredibly entertaining, especially when your amigo Fidel chastises old grandpa Hexogen, and I do feel like I missed out not having Alexander. The real problem is how stagnant they come across because you cannot influence any character's fate, except if they died somewhere during your game, and these characters die a lot because you cannot order them to use healing items mid-combat. This aspect of the storyline, more so than the problems with the main quest, is the weakest part of the narrative if you compare these characters to the likes of other CRPGs. Now during the early access period, my greatest concern with the storyline was how could an adventure, as bizarre as Adam, ever create as meaningful of a resolution as the journey? The short answer is they didn't, but the longer answer shouldn't dissuade you from finishing the game. Part of the problem is that there are many side quests with no relation to the hubs, so their omission to the ending is understandable. Even the few quests that do determine how each settlement turns out can often have various ways to resolve their dilemmas, peacefully, through violence, or by other nefarious methods. The main quest line, however, is neutered from providing as much death as the other quests because these quests are structured as a mystery where the revelation is what you are working towards. Now these quests do provide you moments where you do have agency, but other than immediate consequences, they have too few after effects reflected through the ending slideshow. And the ending's ambiguity feels like one adventure that ended too soon from where it should have ended. The expression, it's about the journey, not the destination, is a phrase all too common for games because what we cannot admire about their execution, we can appreciate the experience. As most gamers and most game developers would attest, we play games, not finish them. Adam RPG currently has an average Metacritic critical rating of 70, and if you were able to switch timelines where Fallout came after Adam, the most critics today would likely rate Fallout similarly. I mention this hypothetical scenario not to imply that Adam is as good or as bad as Fallout, nor to diminish other critics' perspectives. My point is, if you can learn to forgive the many, many mistakes Fallout has made, then you can also learn to accept Adam. You might find that comparison unfair given that Adam is a game 20 years after Fallout, but you also have to remember it was a game made for those same players 20 years ago. To those fans, and for the many people who can't appreciate games in spite of their flaws, Adam could be the start to a new nuclear love. Take the chance that there could be